Good morning, good morning. How y'all doing? God bless you too. Welcome to 10 a.m. It's great to start a little bit later. Did y'all get some extra sleep, I hope? A little bit? <laughs> Sideways head nods. Um, well, if you want to stand with us, we're going to worship together. You're welcome to sit, dance, kneel, stand, whatever, however you'd like to express your love and worship to the Lord. It's so good to see you all this morning. I'm going to pray and we'll get started. Actually, quick announcement. There are the uh, worship slides online. These signs have QR codes. You can hold your phone up to that if you need to get lyrics to sing along. Uh, and other than that, yeah, let's just be free as we worship. God, thank you so much that we get to come together as a church family today. Uh, Jesus, that you call us your body, that we're not orphaned, we're not forgotten or abandoned, but Jesus, you love us and you're for us. And thank you that you gave your life for us, God, that we could be engrafted in, that we could be, uh, that you are the vine and we're your branches, God, and we're connected to you. God, we give you our attention today. God, in the midst of everything that's going on, we just decide, Jesus, to set our eyes, to set our mind on things above, to set our eyes on you. Jesus, thank you that you're faithful and you're steady and you're good and that you're kind and you love us and you know us. And God, we just say, let your kingdom come, let your will be done this morning and be glorified as we worship and as we hear from the word later. Yeah, in Jesus' name, amen.
on earth as it is heaven. On just sit here for a minute just remembering that the earth belongs to God and everything that is in it God you're not intimidated by anything that's happening yours is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the power
your hidden glory in creation. Now revealed. Now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name. chain Jesus your name has power to set every captive free your name has power to 
to break every fear. There's no one great, there's no one greater than you, Jesus. You're the name above every name. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever. Now and forever, God, you reign. Let's declare yours is the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name. Yours is the name above all names. Say that again. You have no rival. Lift our voice, sing out to him.
just let's sing this together. There is power in the name of Jesus. Says, there is power in the name of Jesus. Yeah, there is power in the name of Jesus. Yeah, there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. Yeah, there is power in the name of Jesus. Yeah, there is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. To break every chain, to break every. Can we raise our hands as we sing this? Yes, there is power in the name of Jesus. We turn our eyes to you. There is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. Yes, you break every chain, you break every chain, you break every chain. One more time. God, you break every chain, you break every chain, you break every chain. Chain, you break every chain, you break every chain. Yeah. You break every chain. You break every chain, you break every chain, Jesus. How's everyone doing? We good on this fine Sunday morning? You know, if you spend a lot of time watching the news, if you spend a lot of time on the socials, And just, if you've lived in 2020 like I have, I mean, there's a lot to be bummed out about, yeah? There's a lot of stuff going on, controversy everywhere you go. And sometimes, like, we can just come into a space like this and just getting here was the win for us, right? Like, like just, just arriving was the win. If you've got kids like I got kids, sometimes just making it to church was an act of Congress, right? But I want to just dangle a carrot for you that, that we are not people who are called to just, just survive, okay? I, I heard this quote earlier this morning that, you know, if pain is an ocean, then healing is learning how to sail. That this is, this is a life we're called. I mean, think about who we are as people of God, okay? The, the worst thing that it could have happened, which is our God going to the cross and dying for us, is the reason why we have life today. So I don't know about you, but 2020, if it's taught me anything, it's taught me not only to not live unbothered by negative external circumstances, but to actually allow it to propel me forward. And so I don't know about you, but I can't, I can't walk around defeated, I can't, I can't. Not after what God did for me. I, I can't just survive. Not after what Jesus Christ has done for me. And so I just wanna kinda go back into that refrain one more time. Let's talk about the power that's in the name of Jesus. Because this is what it's all about. And I know maybe you just, it was survival to get here. It was everything you could do to show up on this lawn. It was everything you could do to just hit play and get this stream going. But now that we're here, now that we're here, let's worship, yeah? Let's do this. One more time, Preston. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There 
Bible says in Psalm 112 4 it says even in darkness light dawns for the upright that's us that's us let's pray this father we just thank you we thank you Lord God that even when it's the darkest even when times are the hardest Lord, you allow us to sail on the healing that flows from your son. So we just thank you, God, for all that you're doing in our lives. Lord, may, will we, may we not be moved by what we see, Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. But we will be encouraged as we move forward. And we will be the light, Lord God. And we will see the light even in darkness. And we just thank you that, Lord, you break every chain off of us. Lord, enable us to do this. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah, give the Lord a hand, huh? Welcome to The Rock. My name is Sean Patterson. I'm one of the com community group leaders here. So before you take a seat, if you want to do an air high five or elbow bump, I don't even know what we're doing anymore. But yeah, air high fives, just kind of give a salute. But just greet someone before you take a seat. Amen. Or I'm doing double duty today. So um, I just want to make you guys aware of some things that are going on. Again, um, everything that we're going to talk about as far as what we have going on here at The Rock, uh, you can find on our website. And so feel free to go to rockofroseville.com, and you'll see all, all the things that we're talking about here for all the latest updates and things that are going on. Uh, first and foremost, um, our Get Connected, we used to pass out cards and have you fill that out and turn it in. and and we would be able to uh, pray for you or get connected with you. That's all gone digital now. And so if you're online and you wanna get connected, please go to our website, or if you're here, we're not gonna put the paper in your hands. So go to our website, feel free to fill that out, and, uh, and we would love to get you connected. Uh, on that same vein, we've got what we call Acts 2 Communities. Everyone say Acts 2 Communities. Acts 2. Wow, that, that hurt my feelings. Acts 2 Communities. Acts 2. Thank, thank you, brother, thank you, I appreciate you. All right, so uh, we here at The Rock, um, we firmly believe in community. Uh, it's one of kind of the pillars, it's one of our values that's uh, very, very significant and important. And so one of the ways that we do that is we have community group, we used to call them community groups, now we call them Acts 2 Communities. 
and it's basically our way of getting us connected outside of Sunday. Amen? Getting us connected outside of this moment that we have together. Again, if you're anything like me, like I get here, I finally get my, my kids settled down, and then when service ends, they run around this place like crazy. And so I, I intend to spend time with you on Sundays, but if I'm running around, it's not your fault. Silence, cool. Well, I guess you guys are with me on that. All right, but as we get together uh, throughout the week in our community groups, uh, this is a real opportunity for us to lean into relationship with one another. And so if that's something that interests you, if you're not in a, an Acts 2 community, uh, please, I, I implore you to, to get involved. And you can do that also by going to our, our website, uh, rockofrosa.com slash Acts 2, and uh, you can sign up there. Or you can also email community at Rock of Roseville. We'd love to get you plugged in there as well. Um, next, we have our, our men's morning devotionals, Tuesday through Thursday. Any, any fellas in the house that are excited about that? Hello. Hey. Can I, I only, air hug, air hug, air hug. Okay, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, 7 a.m. Okay, this is about 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, the intention is not to take your whole morning or, or to, to, to go very long on this, but just to really get us together. You know, uh, Michael and, and myself and Pastor Mark, we got together and we just sensed that we've got men of God around us who are very much interested in living out the call of God on our lives. To, to live out what God has wired us to do. We, we believe, and in one of our wins is that, you know, Michael will attest this, uh, we're growing this thing already. I think we're two weeks into doing these morning devotionals and we're seeing a lot of guys show up. One of the wins that I have is, uh, I have a gentleman that I work with who you know, doesn't go to church, uh, doesn't walk with Jesus in any way. He's been coming to these devotionals and afterwards he's reaching me out and he has questions and he's buying books and, and he's just beginning to, to open up. And the reason why is because we, we firmly believe that God has called us all as men uh, to, to a few specific and very, very important areas. He's given us a cause, he's given us a, co a conviction, and he's given us a companion, all right? Uh, in other words, he's given us a will to obey, a work to do, and a woman to love. And so as we get together Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday mornings, we're leaning in uh, to, to how to do that better, H how to walk with God better, how to respond to the call of God better, how, how to, to thrive in the realm of relationships in our lives. And so as you come on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, uh, fellas, you will be blessed. We, we firmly believe that. So that's my plug. That's my win. Um, I'm not preaching today, just FYI. So uh, that's that. Um, and then lastly, I think I have one more announcement here. Yes, home girl, thank you. Fourth through eighth graders, she's pa patiently waiting over there. Fourth through eighth graders, if you wanna go with Justina, please, please go. All right, and lastly, uh, tithes and offerings. Um, the Bible says that God has given seed to the sower. Yeah, God's given seed to the sower. Now, if you have done any gardening, or if you understand agriculture in any way, uh, if you know a farmer or you were born on a farm, you, you understand this pretty well. But I'm a city boy, so I need to study this a little bit. Uh, and what I learned is that, you know, for a farmer, for a gardener, they have seed in their hand and they can eat their seed if they want. But if they eat their seed, it, it's less than what they could gain if they would scatter the seed on the ground and plant it, yeah, right? And there is a, a practical application to this, but also a spiritual application, which is practically you reap what you sow, right? That's the Bible too, isn't it, I, I believe, All right? You reap what you sow. You scatter seed and you're gonna get a harvest out of it. We understand that. But the spiritual side to this is to, to give, to be a giver, to be someone who scatters, who gives away. You really align yourself with heaven. Because scripture shows us that Jesus Christ came to this earth and he scattered himself. And he poured his life out. And as he was scattered, he was able to gather us all to himself. And so as we give, this is not just an exercise. It's not a way for us to, you know, to, to get money off of you. I had some friends that I've been hanging out with who that is their one offense. It's the reason why they won't go to church is because of this moment right here. It's really not about that. It's about aligning ourselves with heaven, knowing that God is the ultimate giver. And as we give, we represent him well in that place, amen? So let's pray. 
Um, what you can do, you can give online. Uh, there's an opportunity to do that, I believe, even on the feed here. There's a link that'll allow you to do that. Also, there's orange buckets, these Home Depot buckets that are sitting here as you uh, are on your way out, you can give as well. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you've given seed to the sower. We thank you, Lord God, that we have an opportunity to partake in this, Lord God, that you have made us sowers. And Lord, as we scatter our seed, Lord, we can know for a fact that because of the, the practical principles of agriculture and the spiritual principles of heaven, that there's a harvest that comes at the other end. However it comes, Lord, we don't control that, but we thank you that, Lord, though, as we, as we roll the dice, Lord God, you determine outcomes. And so we just lift up our offering to you, Lord God, knowing that for some of us, it's gonna cost something to be able to give, but we thank you that you are faithful, that you are so faithful to us. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen, amen. 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 All right, it's my pleasure now to introduce the man of God of the hour. Everyone give a hand for Dr. John. Oh, oh my. I know, that's why I just whispered into his ear that we're, we're twinning today. I didn't, didn't know that was what was going down, but you know, when you, when you're in sync with the spirit, it just works things out like that. Good morning to the rock. Great to see all of you, and great to uh, be able to connect with those of you tuning in live on Facebook or, or Instagram or YouTube or wherever else we're live. Um, this has been uh, quite a season that we've been in this year, and uh, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about it as much as I want to spend time talking about us. And so um, in the midst of this, this series, uh, the Rock has been leading you through the Rock leadership on the view from the Rock, kind of just reconnecting with these components here of the vision, the identity, community, and mission, and and this whole larger idea of discipling leaders that transform culture. Right? I think in the midst of so many things happening in our in our world and in our nation, there's a lot of ways that that, that the church has been has been blowing in the wind a little bit, right? And and we've been affected in some. Uh, in, in some very, um, very impactful ways. And there's been some positive things that have come out of it, but there's also been some challenging things that have been a bit negative. And in the midst of all of that, one thing that has not changed is the mission of the church. Because the mission of the church is the mission of Jesus Christ, and that hasn't changed. And, and this same mission has been, uh, has been embraced and has been advanced all around the world in a variety of contexts under a variety of governments, in a variety of socioeconomic uh, statuses, in a variety of, of cultural situations. The mission of Jesus is carried by the church in all of these different contexts, and it's being successful. I was reading not too long ago about how the church in Iran is exploding. It is now the fastest growing church in the world, Iran. Iran. And I'll mention two things, two things that, that they noted in this article. Number one, there's a bunch of women leading the movement. Amen. Number two, they don't have any buildings. How's that happening? House to house. And God is working with people house to house, house to house, house to house. So, so I say that because don't, don't, don't think that we're having some kind of second class experience because we're not in the building. Right? <laughs> it, it never was about that. We went the first 300 years without a building. Right? Okay, I say some of y'all need to read some history or something. And I, I need to find a new spot for my water also. Let me share this story with you and then we'll jump in. Little Johnny, and I like Little Johnny because my name is John, so I'm picking on Johnny. Little Johnny, he loves the game of basketball. Absolutely loves the game of basketball. He loves playing with other kids. He loves the feeling of competition. He loves just hanging out in, a, in an atmosphere that's designed for just fun and play. He loves the game of basketball. He just loves games, period. But not as much as his dad loves the game of basketball. See, his dad has been competitive since he was in junior high and then high school and then and then college, and of course, he was that one guy who almost had his chance to go to the NBA, and then that injury, 
injury happened and he wasn't able to go. So his dad sees basketball a little bit different than, than little Johnny. And so at the basketball games, little Johnny is out there just again, just enjoying being out on the court. He really doesn't have any intentions of scoring at all. It doesn't even really cross his mind. He just enjoys the game. And so when little Johnny is guarding the player who he's supposed to guard and he's, he's not really paying that much attention because he's just having fun, and the guy who he's supposed to guard goes past him and scores. And in the stands is his father who says, Johnny, what are you doing? Pay attention. Guard your man. Focus, focus, focus. The little Johnny looks in the stands. He hears his father with clear and stern rebuke for Johnny's current behavior. Johnny gets the ball. He's dribbling. And he is so excited that he just got the ball and he's just dribbling. Doesn't matter what direction he's dribbling. He is just dribbling the ball and he's heading in the right direction for his goal. He shoots and it doesn't even appear he was aiming at anything. And the ball goes over the backboard and little Johnny's father Little Johnny, that's not how we do it. You're part of our family. You better pay attention. Get the ball. Get it again, and you better shoot it. And next time, you better make it. Now, what little Johnny is learning really, really quickly, quickly and deeply is that his acceptance by his father is connected to his performance and achievement. Anytime Johnny makes a mistake, his father is on him. On the other hand, same scenario, Johnny's the same, but his dad is different. And this time, same scenario, little Johnny is not really good at defense, and the guy he's supposed to guard goes right past him, and his dad says, Johnny, you missed him again. That's okay, son. Just try it again. Try it again, and make sure that you're having a good time out there. A little Johnny's all excited. <laughs> okay, Dad. And then Johnny gets the ball. And Johnny's dribbling down the court. He's so excited because he never gets the ball. This time he got it on accident, and he gets the ball. He's dribbling down the court, and he shoots with all his effort. Ugh! And you'd have thought he, he was thinking he was playing a shot put. But, but the, and the ball went way over the backboard. And he looks in the stands, and his dad says, that's okay, Johnny. That's all right. Get the ball and try it again. Y'all see him? That's my boy. That's my son. Make sure you have fun out there, Johnny. I love you. And little Johnny learns quickly and deeply that he's loved and accepted no matter his performance. Both of those situations affect little Johnny's sense of identity. Am I important or is what I do important? Am I important if what I do is important and I'm successful or Am I important because I am just who I am? am? Does my father love me or does he love what I can do? There's a different sense of identity in both of those scenarios. And all of us here today and watching by video have had experiences just like little Johnny. Both of them. 
whether it was out on a basketball court, whether it was being a cheerleader, whether it was your grades, whether it was your, your even uh, the, the college you went to, or the fact that you didn't go to college, or the branch of, of military that you went to, or, or whatever else. We, sometimes when we don't meet certain people's expectations, those, those who we love, those people who are supposed to speak life to us and value and identity and worth, sometimes when we don't meet their expectations, other things come out. And we begin to attribute different aspects of our experiences to our sense of worth and our sense of value. Am I pretty enough? Am I smart enough? Am I big enough? Am I strong enough? Am I fast enough? Am I good enough? And all of these things are problematic when it comes to us having a strong sense of identity. Now, you may say, well, uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan, you, you're going to be talking about mission today. I am. But in a different way. Because when we look at how all of us have been affected by life, I mean, no matter, even if you had really, really great parents, they weren't perfect parents. They still said and did some things that, that, that rubbed you the wrong way. They still said and did some things that even unbeknownst to them still caused you to have some kind of, uh, uh, it affected you in, in a deep and powerful way. Some positive and some negative. But these things affect our sense of identity as we're trying to grow up and learn who we are. We're trying to grow up and learn what really gets us affirmation. What is it that our family and the world really wants from us? Who am I called to be? We, we come to those conclusions trying to look at and weigh all of the evidence that we have accumulated in our lives through our experiences and through things that have been said to us and through the times that we were celebrated or the times that we were uh, rejected and, and criticized. And so we have this issue with with identity and then we meet Jesus and in Jesus we see a bigger picture in Jesus we are invited into the family of God and the father calls us his children and now the Holy Spirit that Paul says renews our minds and the Holy Spirit that Paul also says has been poured into our hearts so that we would have the love of God in our hearts. Now he has to do this work of, of undoing the tapes that are rolling in our minds and in our hearts. Now he has to do this work of letting us know who we really are. Before the junk happened, who does God see you? Before you even conceive in your mother's womb, the word says, I know you you before you even got here before you experienced the rejection and the abandonment and the disappointment and the betrayal before all that stuff before all of those things you learned to have to develop your coping mechanisms and, and defense mechanism before all of that i knew you and i knew what i called you to be and i knew you i knew you before all of the junk happened i knew you before all of the, the dirt got piled up on you and now that you're in christ i can show you who that is and i can call you to that place where you are who i say you are and you know it, and you believe it, and you live it. And so the only way that that even happens for us is through Jesus. And the only way we even get Jesus is because Jesus was on a mission. Jesus was on a mission. He was on a mission. And we can think about a variety of passages where Jesus talks about his mission. I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to, set a, uh, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord and to, to preach deliverance to the captives and to give sight to the blind. All these different mission statements you see in the, in the words of Jesus and in the ministry of Jesus. Even all the different gospels all the different Gospels talk about how Jesus gives his followers a commission to go. I'm, I'm sending you out. I want you to go. I want you to carry out the same thing that you saw me carry out. A popular one is in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples. We call that the Great Commission. I don't know why that was called the Great One, uh, because all of them are really good. 
in, even in the, in the end of Mark, Mark chapter 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if, if, you, if you end up grabbing a, a snake, a poison snake, it, it's not going to harm you. I can see why that one is not popular. But then in Luke and the book of Acts, Luke is also the, the author of the book of Acts. You'll be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, all the other parts of the world. Go, 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 and wait till you receive power. And when the power comes, go, go, go. But the one I want to call your attention to today is the one in the Gospel of John, another great commission. In, in, in the Gospel of John, we see these words uh, in John chapter 20. This is after the resurrection. The disciples were hiding out in this home, and so they're, 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 all they know is that Jesus is still dead. All they know is that he is still dead. Everything that he said, it didn't make sense. So like, oh, man, you know, it was, it was cool what was happening, and, but we, he, he was crucified. Like, it's over. Like, we just wasted three years of our lives, and everyone who told us that, it was, that Jesus was a fraud must have been right. I mean, there's a lot of things going through their mind here in this room, but all they know right now is survival mode, that if they did this to Jesus, they're going to be looking for us. So they're hiding out in this house, and this is what, it, what the Bible says in John 20, verse beginning beginning of verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Now, if I was in the room, I'd be like, hold up, Jesus. Um, you didn't knock. You didn't use the door. You didn't even crawl through the window. You're just going to pop up and talk about peace, like, like we're supposed to have peace right now. I don't think so. I need a moment, Jesus. I need, I need, I need a moment, right? Jesus. He says, but he says, peace be with you. But watch what he says next. He showed him his hands. He showed him his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. That's key. That's key. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Now, so to get the I'm sending you, we got to examine the as the Father sent me. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. So let's, let's examine this piece about how the Father sent Jesus, how the Father sent Jesus, why the Father sent Jesus, because as the Father sent Jesus, so Jesus is is sending us. And, and so the first thing I want you to see from this, this, this idea is that Jesus comes as the Son of God. He comes as a Son. The Father doesn't send an angel to do this. The Father sends his Son He's perfect, he's holy, he's righteous. Everything the Father's going to do in those who believe in Jesus to make us perfect, to make us holy, and to make us righteous. But the way he does that, the Father cannot do that in us without making us sons and daughters. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. The first thing you got to note about how the Father sent Jesus was that the Father sent Jesus, the Son of God. And even though Jesus had a whole lot of titles, Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Alpha and Omega, the, the, the first and the last, he who is called Faithful and True, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, even though Jesus has all of these different titles, Jesus did not come to help us become any of those. He came as a son so the father can have more sons and daughters. The first thing about mission is identity. Those who have a deep sense of who they are in Christ, a deep sense of what it means to be a child of God. Those who have a deep sense of identity have a deep sense of calling to the mission. 
When people do not have a deep sense of identity, then they teach mission as if you got to be better at, at the mission, be excited about the mission, passionate about the mission apart from identity. And part of the issue we have in church, we're trying to get people on mission to do something when they don't know who they are first. And so they make, the, they make doing the mission the mission. Are you on mission? We got to get on mission. We got to get on mission. They, they make getting on mission the mission. The mission is not getting on mission. Every mission is about solving a problem. Every mission is about solving a problem. And even when you look at the movies and things like that, there, there, there's eliminating some kind of a threat, right? There's some, there's some crazy person trying to take over the world, and now it's up to you. <laughs> to make sure that that doesn't happen. Every mission is all about solving the problem. Well, what is the problem? The problem is not hate. The problem is not racism. The problem is not communism. The problem is not, is not what all, the, all these other symptoms. The problem is not, listen to me, the problem is not even sin. Oh, now you're paying attention, huh? The problem is not even sin. The problem is why there is sin. When the father looks at the world, he sees a world filled with orphans who don't know their father. That's the problem. And when you look at the world right now, look, that's what orphans do. That's what orphans do when they're trying to find identity in power. If I get more and more and more and more power, more and more and more and more power, and guess what? You can have all the power in the world and still not know who you are and still be empty. Well, what if I get more and more and more money? One of the things that Jim Carrey said, he said, I wish everyone, I wish everyone could be rich so they can find out that you're still empty when you're rich. That you, that I, I wish everyone would discover how empty you can still feel with having millions of money, millions of dollars. Maybe if I find my identity in the, in the right relationships, then I, I'm, I'm with this person, well, I didn't work out. Then I'm with this person, well, I didn't work out. I'm with this person, that didn't work out. It was like, man, these, all these people are just really crazy and jacked up. I really get to know who I am. And people don't think about this consciously. This is a subconscious thing. I really get to know who I am. I really feel valued and worthy and significant if I just am with the right person. And so we could even take mission and make mission all about us. I'm going to go out there and serve. Why? So the Father will be proud of me. I'm going to go out there and serve. Why? Because, because I, I, I want to get more stars on my crown. And we can still make mission about performance. All this happens when we are loose on the identity piece. When we don't know who we are, we really don't know what the mission is about. But when we do know who we are, then we're clear about what the mission is about. And so as the Father sent me, so the Father sends his son. To the world to seek and to save those who are lost. I didn't such a big thing that that before Jesus got got the party started in the wilderness, Satan comes to him. And what is he tempted with identity, right? To doubt what the father said about him. If you are the son of God, command these stones you made bread. If you're the son of God, jump off the cliff because the Bible says that, you know, God's got you catch you. Like he, he, he attacks identity before the mission. Why? Why? Because he knows if he knocks Jesus out in the identity piece, the mission is scrapped. But on the other hand, Jesus knew exactly who he was. That's why the mission was successful. So he couldn't be distracted. He couldn't be delayed. He was successful in the mission because he was clear on who he was. He didn't try to meet everybody's expectations, even though some people said, Jesus, Jesus, can you stay with us a little longer? Can you stay with us? He says, no, I got to go. I know it's disappointing to you, but I'm not here to fulfill your expectations. I'm here on a mission that the Father sent me on. And I've got to go to other villages, too. See, if you don't know identity, then you go, oh, yeah, you know, I don't want to disappoint you. Okay, I'll stay a little longer. And now, and now your ministry, your life is driven by other people's expectations, not driven by the voice of the Father. 
See, anytime you have those kinds of holes in your soul and holes in your heart, those, those vulnerabilities where you're still looking for value and a sense of identity, then you're going to be drawn to those things. But when you find them all in the voice of the Father, the presence of the Father, and what the Spirit is doing, then that makes you a bit more immune to those kinds of temptations to go off track. Because it's really easy to make the mission about your therapy. Huh? Come on now. Right? You know, uh, when, we, when, we are, when we are are going about the mission with a clear sense of identity, we can make sure God gets all the glory without yielding to the temptation to share some with him. And so sometimes we need the validation. We need the affirmation. Sometimes we need those kind of things, and that's where we can make the mission all about that. And when that happens... God cannot move by his spirit the way he wants to do it because of wrong motives. God can do more when you engage sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you engage the mission with a pure heart and you absolutely mess it up all the way. God can do more with that than you trying to perfect it with the wrong motive, with selfish motive and selfish ambition. As the Father sent me, he sends Jesus as the Son. And he says, so now I'm, I'm sending you. Sending you, to, sending you to do what? Well, when you understand that the gospel is about you shifting from being an orphan to being a child of God, then you see that that's what the mission is all about. The mission is not about converting people to Christianity. The mission is not about inviting people to your church. The mission is about those of us who have become children of God helping other people become children of God. See, this is why your identity is so important, because the whole mission is about identity. It's about spreading the identity. That is the mission. So, so it's, it's, it's like, it's very cyclical. You, you, you go from identity, once you get your identity, and part of your identity is being in community, right? Your identity, it gets strengthened in the community with other believers or praying for you, encouraging you, those kind of things. So this kind of comes together. So your identity is, you, 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 and you go out and you handle the mission, which the mission is sharing the message that people can have a new identity. It's sharing the message that there is a father who is welcoming all of us back home. That's the mission. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about a message of a God or who is a father who is writing a love letter to all his kids who are run away from home, and he's letting them know that, one, they can come back, and, two, Christ is the way back. That's the mission. That, that, that is the entire mission. So when your identity is solid, your, your security is in the Father, your comfort is in the Father, all these things are in the Father, then you won't make the mission something different than what it actually is. The mission is sharing the message about how you've experienced a change in your identity. It's about sharing the message about how you have been reconciled to God, and now you've been given, as Paul says, the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. Right? Only people who've been reconciled to God, only those who have come home, can share the message about how you can come home. That is the mission. The mission is not about, it's not about just changing poverty. The mission is not about a racial reconciliation. The mission is not about none of that. The mission is about helping people who are lost become found. It's about helping people who are orphans without a spiritual father find in, in Jesus the way home to God the Father. That's the mission. And when that happens for real, then there's a change in the justice system. Then there's a change in racial reconciliation. Then there's a change in poverty. Then there's a change in government and education and Hollywood and entertainment. Then there's a change when the hearts change by being connected with God the Father, solidified in their identity in Jesus Christ, that's where there's a change. So that's what we got to be focused on our mission, but we can't just be focused on our mission alone. We got to make sure we are rooted and grounded in the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We got to make sure that we know who we are. When we know who we are, we also know what we're not supposed to be doing. That's how clarity about the mission comes about, clarity about identity. But if you're still seeking for some things in your soul and in your heart, from these other human broken relationships and haven't yet found it in God the Father, you will turn the mission into something else or you will neglect it altogether. And then the mission either doesn't happen. It's like, man, how can I, how can I go in and help you and help serve you? And I got my own issues. 
there goes the mission because now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about myself. I'm thinking about where I'm lacking, what I don't have. So I'm not looking through the lens of grace. I'm not looking through the lens of abundance. I'm not looking even through the lens of obedience. I'm not looking through the lens of love. I'm looking through the lens of selfishness. Like, I can't do all that when I, I don't even know what to say. I don't have the resources. I wish I had more so I could give more. No, <laughs> generosity is not about how much you have. <laughs> you're, you're either generous when you're broke or not. <laughs> uh, having more things doesn't make you more generous. <laughs> if with the wrong heart, it gives you more things to protect. The more stuff you get, the more things you want to protect. If generosity is not in your heart, having more things. So don't believe the lie. Well, if I just had more money, I'd give more. No, no, you wouldn't. You have more money now than you had before, and you still don't. Right? I'm kind of talking to myself because one time, I, how much time do I have? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you this. Did somebody say all day? Did somebody say all day? Or was that just in my spirit that I hear all day? I'm just kidding. So this one time, I'll show this real quick, and then I'll, 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 I'll wrap it up. Possibly. So this one time, I had this $100 bill. Somebody had gave it to me, right? $100 bill. I'm like, oh, sweet, right? I'm going to bless somebody with this. You know why? Because I am generous, right? I had it in my wallet, looking for opportunity for God to just, just, God, you just speak to me on who you need to have this $100 bill, and I will gladly give this $100 bill. You know, I want to be a blessing to somebody, Jesus. I want to be a blessing to somebody. And I had the $100 bill in my wallet for eight months. I just never had confirmation, you know what I'm saying? I just, there's no one, never, I didn't see the skies open up. I didn't see a light come down and say, this is the one. I didn't see a star with Bethlehem saying right here. I didn't, I didn't see none of that. I'm like, well, I just, I just don't have, it's just too bad that, because uh, I really want to be a blessing to somebody, and I just don't have any, any serious candidates right now for the generosity that I just want to pour out over to the world. And so, so God asked me one time, he's like, well, so why is this still in your pocket? I'm like, well, you asked a good question. God, why is this still in my pocket? And he gave me these different faces. Show me all the opp different opportunities. Now, did God know I wasn't going to give that $100? Yes, he did know. But what I didn't know is how much I wouldn't want to do it. See, I thought I was generous. I wanted to give it. Clearly, I did not. <laughs> Clearly, I did not. He used that to reveal something to me in my heart. See, that's kind of a mission kind of dynamic. Oh, to, to, to be a blessing, to, to do some outreach, to do, think about somebody before me. Um, and I realized, man, there's something, there's something there. So then we had a talk. And we had a talk. It, was, it wasn't about money. It wasn't about generosity. It wasn't about $100 bills. It was about my heart and what I felt about identity. I see? That, 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 that's the piece that oftentimes gets overlooked when we talk about mission. We talk about how desperate of a situation the world is in, how much we have to do it. We can break down different ways to do mission. And, and all those things can be true. But what can sabotage your efforts what can cause you to learn a lot about mission and still not do it. Some of you know so much about mission, you can teach it, you're just not on mission. Anybody, anybody bold enough to go, yeah, that's me, <laughs> right? We, we know a lot about it. We've learned a lot about it. We got books, journals, podcasts, conferences. We, we got all, right? We got all of it. Look at our nation. There's a gap, right? And where's that gap? That gap is an identity of the church. If the church overall doesn't know who she is, then the mission goes unaddressed. And instead, we can just talk about all kinds of other things inside the building, how, how bad things are getting out there. It's tough. It's tough. I was, I was listening to um, the Moana, we were watching Moana the other day. The last time I was here, I played a clip from The Lion King. I'm, I'm not going to play a clip from Moana, only because the lyric I want you to hear is kind of hard to hear. But th so the father is trying to teach his, da his daughter, Moana, to stay on the island because the island is safe, like not to go beyond the reef, right, out in the ocean. Don't go beyond the reef. He had a bad experience when he went beyond the reef. He actually lost his friend because the waves got crazy. He his friend died out there. So he's, his whole thing as chief, like no one goes beyond the reef, right? And so Moana just feels drawn out there. She feels drawn to it. I want to go out there. And so there's no fish anymore. The, the plants are dying. I mean, the, everything is just going bad. It really, there's a, there's a need to go beyond the reef. But the father sings this song, and, he, and, and in this song, he talks about, um, he says this line, our tradition is our mission.
this tradition. She, he, he talks about all the things that are going on in their lives and the coconuts and this and that. And we, we make the leaves from the, from the trees. <laughs> he says, y'all expect me to go and dance, right? I, I, no, I'm not doing all that. But he, he's, he's singing a song, beautiful song, lovely song. And the whole point of it is, this is why we don't leave Moana. We don't venture beyond the reef. The tradition is our mission. Maintaining what we have, honoring what we've always done, that's our focus. What if a church thinks that? This tradition is our mission. See, there's a tweak there in the identity piece. When you know who you are, then you'll be more apt to feel called to the mission and no one has to convince you that it's something that you should do. It's something you can't not do because of who you are. And so I, I found it that sometimes in my own life where I've tried to convince people to share the gospel, and I came to the conclusion it hasn't changed them. <laughs> what I look like trying to tell somebody, you should share the gospel. You don't have to convince anybody to share a good restaurant experience. When you have good food, you leave, you go out to your car, the manager doesn't come out and say, hey, 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 before you leave, just can you make sure that you share your experience on Facebook or something? They don't do that. You're taking pictures when the food gets there. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like you, when you're excited, when something impacts you, no one has to convince you to tell somebody. So maybe the gospel has not impacted as many people as we think. Then what will we be doing convincing people not changed by the gospel to be passionate about sharing the gospel? So we got, we got to start at the foundation. Did you meet Jesus? Did you? Not here. 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 Did you meet him? Has he, has he changed you? Here. Because if not, listen to me carefully, and I'll end, I'll end with this for real. <laughs> if he hasn't changed you here in your heart, I cannot give you a strong enough argument to your mind to engage the mission. I'll try. If he, if he hasn't changed your heart, if he hasn't given you something to talk about, I can't do it. If he hasn't changed your heart where there is a fire on the inside where you love Jesus and you love God, if he hasn't changed your heart, if, if honestly, if you're still the same person you used to be, how, what do I look like trying to tell you to change from your neighborhood? What do I look like trying to give you evidence after evidence after just, just a whole stack of evidence coming here with a logical argument of why you should engage the mission, why you should tell other people that they're lost and when, when you still might be? So we got to start here. Are you in the family? Did you meet Jesus? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Has he changed your life? Can you see the difference from darkness to light? Can you see the difference from orphanhood to being a son and daughter? If you've seen a difference, I don't have to tell you. I don't have to try to convince you today that you ought to tell somebody. You'll have a case of the can't help it. The woman at the well, Jesus didn't say, now listen, what I want you to do, I've got plans for Samaria. What I need you to do, listen, I want you to go through this, 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 and this, and I want you to go tell people exactly this particular script because this script worked in Nazareth, so I want you to use this script in Samaria. He didn't do none of that. He encountered her, and he waited as she ran back to the city saying, come see this guy who just changed my life. I want to ask you, before I talk about mission anymore, are you in the family? Do you know Jesus? If you know Jesus and he has changed your life, you will tell somebody. The mission is all about identity. Your identity and helping other people discover their identity. The mission is all about identity from start 
to finish. As the Father sent me, so I send you, are the words of Jesus. Let's all stand. Don't, don't tempt me. Somebody said, keep going. Oh, I'm, I'm, part of my passion about this is I'm looking at stuff. I'm like, you know, when Jesus said, you know, the world will know you're my disciples if you love one another. I'm looking at a lot of stuff that's not love. I'm like, man, maybe, maybe we don't have as many people in as we thought. Could this be showing us something? Could this be showing us that everybody who raised a hand and repeated the prayer is not in? Could this be showing us something that everybody who took a dunk is not in? Could this be showing us that there aren't as many Christians as we thought? And if so, that makes the urgency of the mission even greater. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your desire to not leave us in our sin, to not leave us as orphans. I thank you for your pursuit of us, your, your reckless love, your pursuing love, your eternal love. I thank you for this love that is constantly coming after us. Father, I pray for everyone who hears this message right now, that you would help all of us in our hearts to go deeper with you, to open our hearts up more to you, to understand and to experience the life-changing power of the gospel. Your word says that you've poured your love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit in Romans 5. And Father, I pray today for every son and daughter of yours that we would experience a deeper revelation of your love. And that, that, that love would, would, would drive us out into the world to help other people be clear about your invitation to be clear about your love, be clear about the opportunity to be in your family. Father, let us be compelled by love, not by religion, not by a sense of duty, not by a sense of trying to uh, be affirmed by you or even by our congregation, our friends, but we, we want our, our experience of your love to compel us. So take us deeper, take us deeper, take us deeper, so I pray the same prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesians, that we would all, me included, know the height and the breadth and the depth of your love, that we would be rooted and grounded in your love, and that we would love others because you first loved us. Father, we know that our mission is very, very important. We wouldn't even be saved had someone else not been about the mission. Someone shared the gospel with us. Someone told us that you were actively pursuing us. And, some, and we heard it more than once. We heard it over and over. We heard it for years. And then our hearts opened up to you like a budding flower in, in, in bloom. And now, Father, we, we see the state of our nation. We see the state of our world. We see the urgency even more clear than we ever have. But we don't want to go out there because we think we should. We don't want to go out there because we don't want to feel guilty for not going. We want to go out there because we've been transformed by your love. And we want other people to experience the same thing. Father, I pray for the rock here and those alive. I pray for this entire congregation. Those who feel weakness and sickness in their bodies, God, I pray for healing. Those relationships that are in trouble right now, Father, I pray for healing. In the name of Jesus. And I pray that we would hear you pricking at our hearts, pricking at our hearts. Baptize us in your love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 I think that's it. Is anyone else coming? Is that it? All right. All right. God bless you and good night. <laughs>